All right, good morning again. Okay. This one, uh, sorry. This one, this one might have got a little out of control when I was writing it. So I'm going to try to go fast through it so you're not sitting here all day and I'll read some. And I wrote the scriptures down so I read them so that will go a little bit faster. I just want you to know that. Before we start, Michael, did you bring your guitar today? I just want to extend an invitation. Anytime you want to do that, feel free to do that. You can bring your guitar, come up, play anytime. We'll, we'll love that. All right. So um, before I go into the message, I want to give you the how this message came. Um, but I want to be careful. And, and the reason I want to be careful is because I don't want to use spiritual manipulation. Okay? So understand something. Am I on? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, so understand something. I am not a prophet. I am not the Holy Spirit. I'm not a prophet. Okay, I can be illumined, but I cannot be inspired. You understand the difference? God can show me his word, and he can illumine a concept to me to, to bring, give light to, to anybody. But I'm not an inspired prophet. I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very fallible. You understand what I'm saying? And, and the Lord doesn't say through me what you should do. Okay, the Lord communicates through me concepts that you can pray about and figure out what you should do or shouldn't do all right do you understand what i'm saying now having said that i was praying all week long for the message that the lord would have me present to you this week because i didn't have an idea and i said god what do they need just tell me what they need i'll preach on that and i was praying and praying and praying and the message that came to me was return to your first love but I wasn't confirmed then on Wednesday morning, as I usually do, I went over to Campus Sobel and I prayed with Chef Miguel and Pastor Ken, Nitschiff. And as we were praying, I prayed right before Pastor Ken prayed. I said, Lord, please reveal to me what you want me to speak this week to your people because I don't know, but I need a message, but it needs to be a message from you. And right after I prayed that prayer, Pastor Ken prayed in his prayer, the counsel to the church in Ephesus, Lord, return me to my first love. So it was, it was confirmation. So what I'm saying by saying that is that this message might not be for every one of you, but it's for someone. All right? Maybe for me, maybe for you too. I don't know, but I just wanted you to hear that. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I just pray that this message will have your power, that it will come from you. I'll just be your tool and your mouthpiece up here extending a message and that you will use it for your purpose. And I know you will, Lord, but if there's someone who's struggling with us today, I really pray that this encourages them and, and gives them peace and gives them hope and gives them a plan on how they can handle this problem that they have, Lord. And if it's all of us, I pray that it gives all of us peace and comfort, Lord. And um, I just ask that your will will be done here today and that you will bless this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was in seminary, I had a teacher who told a story, and I was having a really hard time understanding it. He told this story about this woman he was working with. She was in her, her early 40s. She had been raised Adventist her entire life, and she had been a very sweet girl growing up. She was what you would call people pleaser, and she had always done what was right, and she seemed to have an amazing love for God, and this extended she got married, and she was active in the church and she gets to her early 40s and she has an affair on her husband and leaves him and leaves the church and has nothing to do with it any longer and the professor is talking about this and he said i want to tell you something now this was dr swanson he's a counselor um, and works with you know with 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 emotional trauma and things like that he said i want to tell you there's a phenomena in the adventist church it's probably in all churches but you know he's an adventist so there's a phenomena that young women and young men grow up in the church they do what they're told because that's what they're supposed to do they follow god and then somewhere along the way, as they get a little older, they completely break down. They leave the church, and they want nothing to do with God. They're lost, and their lives completely seem to unravel. He went on to talk about how to treat them, and he was frustrated with the church because the church's response is usually church censor or discipline now there's times for church censor and church discipline don't get me wrong but the point that he was making was that these people don't need discipline right now they need to learn how to have a relationship with god 
That's what they're lacking. They haven't been taught that part. They've been taught what is right and what is wrong, but they haven't learned how to have a relationship with God. You know, he's right. They need someone to help them become converted or at least teach them about true conversion. Um, Often those who grow up into the church or even those that come later into the church come because of fear tactics. They hear the same messages that others do, but it doesn't strike the same nerve. It doesn't hit the same chord. Instead, following God to them is not because out of love, but because they're afraid if they don't, consequences or punishment will come upon them. And I want to speak to those people today. There's a description of a king in Judah that has always troubled me. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verses 1 and 2. I want you to read it. You've maybe read this before, but I want you to look at it. And I'm just going to focus on those two verses because that's all we need to look at to get the picture of this king. 2 Chronicles 25, verses 1 and 2. 2 Chronicles 25, 1 and 2. Amaziah is this king, 2 Chronicles 25 and, 20 and 1 and 2, and he has a problem. And that's what I want to focus on. Now, you can read the rest of 2 Chronicles 25, and you can see his life, and you can see the effects of his problem, but I just want to talk about the root of the problem today. 2 Chronicles 25, 1 and 2, verse 1, Amaziah was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. The story sounds great, doesn't it? But we've got to finish the sentence. But not with a perfect heart. He did what was right, but his heart wasn't in it. He had heard truth. He had heard the stories of the kings that came before him. He had been counseled that if you follow God, he will bless your kingdom. He will bless your leadership. But if you don't follow God, he will curse your kingdom and curse your leadership. And he had heard that growing up, and he decided that he made a business choice, if you will. You understand what I'm saying? It would be better business practice for me to do what God wants me to do, because then he'll bless my kingdom. It became a philosophy, if you will. If I do what God wants, then I get what I want. You understand? Kind of a prosperity gospel, if you will. Now, I'm not going to go into what other churches teach because that's my point, because what I really want here is for self-reflection to take place. I want you guys to reflect on this concept in your own lives and see if maybe this issue plagues you. Because King Amaziah learned from a young age that if he did God's will, he would be blessed. But he never developed that relationship with God to do it out of a response of love. It was only If it got him what he wanted, he was willing to do what there was. Now, this reminds me of the message to the first church that receives the letter, the seven churches. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Now, in case you're wondering if you can skip prayer meeting because you can hear sermons on Revelation here, you can't because it's completely different material. All right, I am going to cover the seven churches as we go through Revelation, and I'm going to go church by church, and I'm going to give detail, but I'm going to give a lot more detail than I'm going to give in a sermon like this when I'm just, except, you know, when I'm just expounding on one point of that church. So if you want to hear Revelation verse by verse, and you want to get as much information as you can, you need to come Tuesday night to prayer meeting at 630. But I am going to speak on the conference of Revelation as we go through because it's a great book. And there's a lot of good stuff in here, especially for the end times, which we live in. Revelation chapter 2, and I want to look at verses 1 through 6, because um, King Amaziah reminds me of the church, that re- the first church in the letter of the seven churches. He reminds me of the message that came to Ephesus. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 6. Verse 1, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works, and your labor, and your patience, and how you cannot bear them which are evil, and that how, and how you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and have borne, and have patience, and for my name's sake have labored, and have not fainted. Nevertheless, I have something against you, because you have left what? Your first love. Remember, therefore, from when you are fallen, 
from where you are fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of this place, except you repent. But you have this, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, there's a message in Revelation to the first church. I'm sorry. We've already been over that. If you read the description of this church, you will see that it's an exemplary church. In fact, we would probably love to have the same identifying markers set about us. Faithful to Jesus, keeping his truth, resisting evil and apostasy, missionaries with the missionary spirit, and of course, they even hated the deeds of those who taught that the law of God was not important. Personally, I would love it if God used those descriptive words about me to describe my Christianity. If God said that about me, I would be happy. You understand what I'm saying? And I believe all of you would be happy if that was the account that God gave of you. And that's the account that he gives of this church. They're hard workers. They're missionaries. They follow the truths of Jesus. They hate evil and the apostasy. And they even don't like the deeds of those who teach that it's okay to not hold God's law dear, to not keep God's law. I would think as Seventh-day Adventists, this describes us. And if it doesn't describe you, I'm going to suggest that it should describe you. This is what we're called to. But he goes on, and he says, but you left your first love. Slowly along the way, the church of Ephesus found themselves working hard for Jesus. Duty began to take the place of devotion. While they are working hard for Jesus, they were losing sight of Jesus, they, the losing sight of the Jesus they were working for. They began to believe that working for Jesus was what Christianity was all about. They became doers of the word, but lost their love for the author of the word. To them, spirituality became a to-do list. Like King, Am like, sorry, like King Amaziah, they followed God, but not with their heart. It's a sad condition to be in, to be a follower of God, but not because you love him, but rather because philosophically you believe it to be a better way to live, because of the benefits it affords you. Perhaps you've created identity around being a Christian. You like the way it sounds. You like the fellowship you get from church. You like hearing sermons every week and even participating in church on a regular basis. Maybe it makes you feel good. Maybe it's a source of pride for you. Perhaps you enjoy the accolades that people give you for all the efforts that you put into the church. That's what the Ephesians were doing. Oh, they loved working for Jesus. They loved his truth. They loved the accolades they got. Oh, you Ephesus people, Whoa, you're great. That pat on the back. But they began to love that more than Jesus. Perhaps Perhaps your struggle's a little different, though. You see, the devil doesn't care how he gets you to lose sight of Jesus. He's perfectly happy to lead you to godly activities, to activities that God would have you to do, but twist your motivation for doing them. It happens all the time. The devil is content to use family to lead you from Jesus. After all, doesn't Paul teach us through inspiration that he who does not provide for his family is not, not of the faith and worse than an unbeliever? In 1 Timothy 5.8. And then there are some that read that verse and say, I must provide for my family. I must care for my family. That's my duty as a Christian is to provide for my family. And they start providing for their family. And they lose sight of the Jesus that that family is supposed to be raised for and that family becomes an idol to them. They start loving their son or their daughter or their spouse more than they love their Jesus. It becomes an idol. And you say, oh, but does that really happen? When I was in mission college, thank you, Phil. When I was in mission college, there was a girl there. And she was a young girl. She was asked to go do Bible work. She was, I think, 19, 20 years old. She was asked to go to Ohio and do Bible work. 
And you could tell that she was convicted because when she would tell you the stories about how she had prayed about this and what God was asking her to do, it was clear as day that God was definitely asking this woman to go do Bible work. But she went and she asked her parents what they thought that she should do. And her parents said, absolutely not. You shouldn't go to Ohio to do Bible work. There's no way. In fact, those good God-fearing folks that are telling you to do that are trying to take advantage of you. You shouldn't go. And she didn't go. Now she's in her 30s, late 30s. She works menial jobs, has no purpose in life, doesn't know what it is, and there's no sign that it's coming to an end. She's completely messed up. She didn't follow God. You see, on the one hand... The parents forgot their duty as parents. Yes, we're to provide for our families, but understand this, we are stewards of God's family because our children are really God's children. And he gives us the privilege to train them up to be God's men and women. But we are stewards of our children to raise them to the glory of God. That is our responsibility. They are God's children and they're never ours. They're always his. And he gives us the, the privilege of loving them and sharing that love with them and growing with them and teaching them how to. But let me remind you something, that no matter how you view your children here in heaven, they're going to be your brother or your sister. Amen. And on the other hand, the girl... She must have reasoned in her mind, well, you know the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. They told me not to go. That's my duty. That's what I'm supposed to do. And that is your duty. Unless God's asking you to do something different. Because God supersedes all. Let me ask you about this. What about devotions? Does God want us to do devotions? Is it the Christian's duty to do devotions? Who thinks it's the Christian's duty to do devotions here? Now, I hate to tell you this, but you're wrong. It's the Christian's privilege to do devotions. It's our privilege to go to God and spend time in his word. And yes, we should be faithful to that. We should be faithful to that privilege. We should hold it near to heart. It should be something, it, sh it should be uh, 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 something that we ascribe to every single day. It should be a priority in our lives. But it's a privilege. You see, I was doing devotions all my life. And I came to a point where it became my duty to do devotions. And I thought to myself, well, if I just do devotions, I'll have a better day that day because I did my devotions. Or if I just do devotions, I won't fight with my wife because I did my devotions. Maybe some of you can relate to that. Or, or if I just do my devotions, I'll be saved. And devotions came to me as my salvation. And they became a drudgery. I got to the point where I didn't even want to do my devotions anymore. I didn't want to sit down and pray and read my Bible because it was just another work that I had to do to perform for God. You see, the devil doesn't care what he uses to distract you from God. He'll use whatever he can find to do that. But he, he must be our first love. Devotions connect us to the one that gives us power to overcome. Devotions connect us to the one that gives us power not to fight with our wife. Devotions connect us with Jesus who gives us power to have a better day. Devotions connect us to the Savior. They don't save us. Do you understand the difference? And the Ephesians were doing all of these works just like they were supposed to do. Textbook and textbook and textbook and following the truth and loving the truth. But they lost their love for the God of the truth. Now, having defined the problem pretty clearly, I want to talk about the solution to the problem. I don't ever want to preach a sermon where I tell you that you have a problem and not give you a way out. I want to give you something that you can do to fix the problem because Jesus wants to help you overcome. Jesus' word gives us what we need 
to be overcomers, to be victorious. And he wants to see us succeed because Jesus loves us and he has a purpose for our life and it's a good purpose. And he never points out our condition without giving us hope and a way to get out of that condition. And so I want to present to you now the condition, I'm sorry, I want to present to you now the solution that you can put together, the method you can use if you find yourself in this position. A person that loves the works of God and doing the works of God, but doesn't love the God of the works. You understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> what do you do when you find you are like King Amaziah, doing everything right, but not with your whole heart? Has prayer become a chore and not fulfilling? Have your devotions become stagnant and not freeing? Has studying the Bible become boring? If they have, I want to suggest to you follow the three R's of returning to your first love. The three R's are remember, repent, and return. Remember, repent, and return. And in case you're wondering where I get the three R's from, they're found in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5. Okay, so let's start back in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have something against you because you have left your first love, says Jesus. And right after he tells them what their problem is, now look, he gives them solution. In verse 5, he says, Remember, therefore, from where you are fallen, repent and do your first works or return to your first works. It's the counsel of Jesus, the three R's. Remember, repent, return. Remember, do you remember what brought you to Jesus? Do you remember being forgiven and feeling the joy that brought you? When you made that commitment that you were going to follow Jesus and that peace swept over you. Do you remember the joy you had reading the Bible and discovering things you'd never seen before and God was talking to you through it? Praying to God and him, him talking back to you and answering your prayers. Do you remember how that felt? Telling your family or friends about Jesus, even though they rejected you, still God gave you those tinglys and those good feelings because you were doing what he asked you to do. Do you remember how it felt to be used for God? The principle in the Bible is, 2 Corinthians 3.18, by beholding, you become changed. If we behold those things, we become like those things. Genesis 9 14 through 16 says, It shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow will be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature over all flesh. And never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God says when he sees the bow in the heaven, he will remember his covenant. And when you see the bow in heaven, what do you think of? You think of the deliverance that God gave to Noah. You think of him saving Noah through a drowning world. You think of the, what his covenant is that he'll never do that again. And when we're in our car driving somewhere and our kids are with us and we see a bow, we all start talking about the story of Noah. Why? Because we remember it based on what we're seeing. God told us repeatedly in the Bible to set up memorials of him to remind us of what he's done in the past. When the children of Israel coming out of the promised land... I'm sorry, when they're coming into the promised land, crossing, crossing the overflowing Jordan, whose waters had stopped in their place and couldn't flow any further, God commanded they pick out 12 stones from the dry riverbed and set them up as a memorial, a reminder for the children of Israel forever that they may know that God led them out of a deliverance. He commanded Joshua in Joshua 4, 6, and 7, they will be a sign among you. In your future, your children will ask you, what do these rocks mean? Tell them. The water stopped flowing in the Jordan when the Ark of the, of the Covenant with the Lord crossed the river. These rocks, these rocks will always remind the Israels, the Israelites of this. And every time their children would see those rocks, it was a chance for the parents to tell them how they got into this land. God told us to remember. We need to constantly remember what he's done for us. Psalms 19, 155. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and I keep your law because I remember you and what you've done for me. That's why I keep your law. 
What more shall I say? Joshua and Caleb, the two faithful spies, when everyone else saw giants in the land and would, that would consume them, they remembered the mighty miracles of God and how he had led them there. They didn't see obstacles. They saw God's miracles and the power that God used to deliver them every step of the way. They remembered God and they had faith to go do the impossible. God wants us to remember. What about Peter when he denied Jesus a third time? He heard the rooster crow and he remembered the words of Jesus that before the rooster crows three times, Peter, you will deny me. And right after he denies Jesus and he hears that rooster crow, Jesus comes walking out with the blood on his face and the bruises and the crown of thorns. And Peter looks at him and he sees that loving expression on his face for Peter. And instantly Peter remembers all the good that Jesus ever did, all the love that he ever showed him, how he had led him, how he had called him from a fisherman to a fisher of men. And in bitterness, he wept and repented because he remembered Jesus. You know, I heard this story, and it may seem silly, but I'm religious about doing it. There's this rich man, multi-billionaire. He went on a walk with his interns one day, and they're walking through the city, and he was talking to his interns and giving them business advice and insight. And this is a billionaire upon billionaire, multi-billions of dollars, and he's walking across the street sidewalk, and he sees a penny on the ground. And he stoops down, and he picks it up. And the interns are like, why would this man pick up a penny? He's got billions of dollars. Isn't that enough? Why does he need a penny? And one of them was brave enough to ask him, why did you pick up that penny? You don't need any money. He said, I didn't pick up that penny because I need money. You see, on that penny, on every single penny, there's an inscription. In God we trust. Every time I see a penny, it reminds me where my riches come from. It reminds me who got me where I am today. It reminds me of the God who has delivered me from the sinful world. I don't care about the money. I care about the God. And every time I see a penny after I heard that story, I stop and I pick it up. And I don't care about the penny. And I don't care how dirty and disgusting it is. If it's really bad, I'll put hand sanitizer on when I'm done. But I pick up that penny because it reminds me of God. And there's been times, and I'm not joking you, where I have been walking and do something I shouldn't do. And there was a penny on the ground right in front of me. And I picked it up and turned back to my car. We must remember what Jesus has done for us. We must remember how God has called us from a life of no purpose. How when we surrender to the call, we felt the joy of salvation, the comfort of forgiveness, the bliss of being a child of God. Do you remember that peace he gave you? The second thing we must do. After we remember, we must repent. The next R is repentance. We must repent for leaving our first love. We must come back to Jesus. Solomon advises us in Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Jesus tells us what he's looking for from us in Matthew 9, 13, but go and learn what this means. I, demire, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not call to the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Mark 1, 15, and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. What is the gospel? Don't you dare tell me it's good news. It's good news, but it's much more. It's God's spell to change your life from a sinner into a saint. It's the power of God that compels you to not be the way that you are when you come to him and to be like Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel is. It's much more than good news. It's power in your lives to be different and to be better. And Jesus says, repent and believe the gospel. Turn from your ways and follow me. He admonished us again in Proverbs 123, repent at my rebuke. Then I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make known to you my teachings. Sometimes we get a rebuke. We don't like it because it feels uncomfortable. 
But God says, repent to it. Heed it. Do what I'm asking of you. And then I will come to you and I'll fulfill your life with joy and bliss and happiness. I'll return the peace and the joy that you once had. We've already talked about David, but he repented from his sin with Uriah and Bathsheba after he was rebuked by the prophet Nathan. He wrote in Psalms 51, where we read, 51, 10 through 12, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And God did restore him to the joy of salvation. God did renew a steadfast spirit in David. Brothers and sisters, if we have fallen from our first love, we must repent and go back to God where we'll find the same power that David did when he needed to be restored. You may have to repent. There may be something in your life that's a distraction, keeping you from growing closer to Jesus. You may be asked to repent of that and give it up. If you are, I'll leave you with this promise from David in Psalms 116, 12. What shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits to me? What can you possibly give to God that doesn't benefit you? Repent. Repent. Finally, we come to the third R. Return. After we remember and repent, we must return. The Bible is very clear about this. Second Chronicles 30, verse 9. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. He will not turn his face from you if, return to him, if you return to him. Joel 2.13, so rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. James 4.8, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Ezekiel 18.32, for I have no pleasure in the death of the one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. And in Zechariah 1.3, therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. We must return to him, return to our first works, return to that which brought us to him in the first place, return to the place where we met him. If you have left your first love, if your spirituality has become a laundry list of do's and don'ts, if you wake up in the morning and start your checklist without spending time with Jesus, without wanting to talk and read about your Savior, then you need to start practicing the three R's. Remember, repent, and return. Ask Jesus to help you. Tell him you want to rekindle that relationship with him. Tell him you want to date with him every morning. Like you want to date with that cute boy or beautiful girl you met when you were younger. I remember those times. Talking way into the night. Too late. On the phone with Sharna. She was driving to her parents' house. I would talk to her for four and a half hours while she drove all the way up here. And it seemed like it was just a minute. All the time. I couldn't wait to see her at church just so I could say hi to her again. Just to see her put a smile on my face. When she would come and she would sing about Jesus. And I remember that time when she went out of her way. No one invited her. She had heard that I was at a pool hall shooting pool with some other friends. A, a good pool hall, don't worry. And she came. And that's when I knew I had a chance. And I remember that first date, and this is going to sound really silly, sitting across the table at Sweetwater's Donut Shop, just talking to her and sharing a donut. I remember that time. It was special to me. I remember when I first came to Jesus. I didn't even have a Bible, but I'd go on long walks with him. You see, my family was in Arizona. I didn't talk to my dad in Michigan ever. I talked to my mom maybe once every three weeks or every month or so. I didn't have any friends anymore because when I found Jesus, they want nothing to do with me. He was everything. He was all I had. 
And I would go on walks with him. And we'd walk through the parks, and I would just talk to him. And we'd go by the goose pond, and he would protect me from those angry geese that would try to attack me all the time. And I would talk to him about life and, and looking for answers and how I could change and be better. And believe it or not, he would give me great answers that I later found were in the Bible, but I didn't have a Bible at the time, didn't know. I remember talking to Jesus at work and asking him to make me a better worker, and he did. I remember sitting on the rooftops when I was roofing for Jesus. And I would sit up there by myself and he would bring sins to my remembrance that I need to repent of. And I would sit up there with tears in my eyes, confessing and repenting all those sins to Jesus. And I'd ask him for wisdom on how I can share his love and his knowledge with my family and my friends. And he would give it to me and I would use it. And they didn't always accept it, but they heard it. It's what they needed to hear at that time. And I could tell the difference. And so do you. You know when you talk to your family and friends about Jesus when it sinks in. And you know when you just annoy them. And when I'd ask Jesus for what to say, he would give it to me. And I was so happy. Because I knew that I had Jesus. Just like I was so happy on that first date sitting across that table from Sharn and Sweetwater sharing that donut. Because I knew I had found the woman that God was going to let me live my life with. Do you remember when you first came to Jesus? How you would spend time with him? How it was a joy to read his Bible? How it was a joy to pray with him? How you couldn't wait to find somebody to talk to Jesus about? Do you remember that? You know, it's something you should probably take time to meditate upon this afternoon. When you get a chance, sneak into the corner, sneak into your room alone, and just spend some time with God, just remembering how you first came to Him. Remember the stories of the joys that you've had with Him, the times that you've had with Him, when He forgave your sins, and you realized that weight was lifted off your shoulders, and there was something different now about life. Take time to remember that. If he asks you to repent, repent. And then return. Make a commitment to continue doing that on a regular basis, not because you have to, but because you want to. And if you don't have the spirit to say, God, I want to do this every day, then claim the promise in Haggai that I will heal your backsliding. I will return your heart to me. I will restore the joy of your salvation in Psalms 51. Claim those promises and ask Jesus to do that for you, and he will, because he promised that he would, and because you need it. You know, the message to the church doesn't end there, though. In Revelation 2, 7, we get a wonderful promise from Jesus. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Jesus knows this church. Well, yes, they have lost their first love. Jesus has not stopped loving them. He appreciates their efforts and labors for him. They are still his children. Sure, some of them have some soul searching to do, but Jesus is very much proud of them for all their work, all their labor, all their testing of the truth, sharing their faith with others and resisting evil. He still loves them. He hasn't left them. He's still happy for them. He's still proud of them for the works that they're doing because they're doing God's works. If you're in that condition, he's still proud of you. He still loves you. He still desires to be with you. He just wants to make it better. You guys know how it goes. You've been in a relationship. You've been married for a while. Sometimes marriage isn't easy. And Jesus sees that. And he doesn't just rebuke you and say, what's wrong with you? This should be a joy to you and should be fun to you every day. He says, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you because you're sticking to your commitment. I'm proud of you because you're striving and you're trying. He says, I like that. I'm proud of you. But I can make it better. I can make it better. He says, I can make your spiritual relationship better. To those who overcome.
22, he is going to give it back to those who love him. I'm going to go home and practice the three R's today. And I'm going to continue practicing the three R's. Even if you don't need it, I suggest you should practice the three R's. Keep your relationship with Jesus fresh. Because if your relationship with him, if your spirituality has become a laundry list of do's and don'ts, Jesus can restore you to the joy of salvation. He can return you to your first love. But your part is to remember, to repent, and to return. How about it? Do you want to practice the three R's? Father, you see our commitment. You know where we're at in our lives and our relationship with you. You know what we need. I don't know who this message was for. But Father, I'm going to practice the three R's. And you heard the, the commitment of all those out there. Lord, we do love you. We do thank you. Sometimes we take it for granted. Lord, we're sorry. Forgive us. Have mercy on us. But we have confidence you will when we come to you. We remember how you led us to where we are. We repent for going astray, from wandering from you, Lord, and we want to return. Help us do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn.